Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be getting my brand new R34 GTT transmission and converting it from pull type to push type. That's because I've got an R33 clutch which is push type and they are a lot cheaper. It's a common kind of upgrade that people do. Not, not an upgrade, it's just cheaper to do that. The pull clutches are quite expensive. And it's a bit of a complicated system so it's quite simple to actually convert them over. All you need is these parts here. So we've got a push type front cover, a new release bearing and carrier, which is those two for the push type. This isn't part of the conversion, but because it's a new gearbox, previously I had an R33 GTST box. Now they've gone to 34, they use a slightly different shifter. It's actually the only, well the shift cup is the difference between the two. I just opted for a brand new shifter rather than just replacing the cup. Clutch fork will have to change, obviously you compare the shape of that fork to the shape of the pull type fork. Obviously big differences between those. This is the clip that holds the carrier together. And there is our gasket for the front cover. So all of these parts swap out, they're a straight swap. So we've obviously got our boot already in here. That will probably be different as well. While I'm here, I've also got a push type boot. So that can be added to our list of stuff. So it's a pretty straightforward procedure, like I've been saying. Gonna pull the old stuff off, get the new bearing pressed on, put the new boot on. And there's actually already provisions for the push type slave cylinder. You can see those two holes there. So all we'll be doing is drilling those out, marking them, drilling them out, tapping them, and then we can wind the bolts in for the slave, get all that mocked up and working. Because obviously these are your two holes that they came with from the factory for the pull type. Definitely an easy thing to do, and I'll show you the full list of tools that you'll need to drill out those holes, size of the drill bits, size of the tap, all that kind of good stuff. But yeah, very nice gearbox. They look really good new. Got all the sensors on it apart from the speed sender. That had to come from my 33 box. And I have been told, and it does appear, that they are full of oil from the factory, which is awesome. Just one less thing I have to pay for. I'm going to crack on doing all this kind of stuff. I'll just get Connor over there filming some bits and pieces for me with his <laughs> ice cream. Don't you dare zoom. Don't you dare zoom. Oh. So Connor's not helping us anymore. But yeah, I'm gonna crack on, run through most of the process. Alrighty, so first thing I'm gonna do is pull this boot out. Just push us through from the inside quite easily. And we've got our fork and bearing that's gonna come off. So there's a pin that runs through the fork. As you can see there with a little clip on it. So we're just gonna grab that clip and pull that out. And that pin slides right through. Comes with a little washer as well. And then that is our fork. What I'm going to do is put everything back together the way that it came out. Just because I'll probably be selling this, potentially keeping it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, but I'll keep all the parts together so I don't lose anything. That's our bearing. And like you can see on this fork here, that pin actually locates itself. There's a little hole in the fork where it locates. And then on the other side, you've got a flat surface where it locates as well. That's if you're messing around with the pull side of things, if you decide to put it back together like that or leave it as it is, just so you kind of know what's going on. Next thing from here is pulling the front cover off and replacing it with our other one. We haven't done this before, so we're not 100% sure if any oil is gonna leak out because like I was saying, these boxes come pre-filled, so we may potentially have to turn the box on its end because there is a plug in the end of it. Uh, we may have to turn it on its end and then pull the cover off and stop it back over. And when I did yours, it was already drained, so... Yeah, yeah, so it's a little bit different. So what I think we'll do is pull all those bolts out kind of one by one, slowly, and then we'll see if anything starts leaking out. So that'll probably just be 12 mils all the way around. Those two should Yeah, I think yours had one random 13 in the bottom corner, like someone yeah. stripped it. There's someone across the bolt, but... Ah, oh, well. I don't really need them. So, there is 12 mil bolts all the way around. See, we're kind of going through the process for you. So if you're doing this, you know what not to do. 
we're pretty much finding everything that we definitely should never do. So, you're welcome. Yeah, these ones are all sweet. See, they must use a fair bit of Loctite because that's where, if anything's going to leak, it's going to be these three. Oh, yes. That is a lot. Oh, that's not good. <clears throat> now we know that they are filled with oil. And they have locked that on them for a very good reason. So, what do we learn? The gearbox is full. Look at that fresh Japanese oil though. I mean, it is, but it's not. So it's maybe a litre and a half, two litres. So as you would have seen, we did have to drain the oil out, those bottom three bolts. I'm assuming they're probably black for a very good reason, that the oil will come out from those bolts. So now we should be sweet to zip it all off and swap this cover over, so we will get into it. And there's no Ford back play. I mean, it's a brand new gearbox, so. Yeah, I'd hope not. At least you got a spare gasket. Yeah. Lovely. Um, we might just compare the differences between the two covers, eh? Yeah, main differences, there's, I mean, really, it's nothing major. The shape is almost exactly the same, but there's a pivot ball on the push type, where that's got obviously the locator for the pin, for the clutch fork. That's it, that's pretty much the only difference. Everything else is the same between the two. Same diameter and everything, so yeah. We're gonna chuck this one back on. We're gonna give the gearbox a quick wipe down, just on the inside there, just to make sure the surface is 100% clean because there's little bits of oil that are kind of floating around, mainly at the bottom here more than anything. But while we're here, we may as well get it nice and tidy because it is a brand new gearbox and I'm quite anal about it, keeping it clean. The new gasket just sits on there, like so. And then our new, God almost picked up the other one because they're both new. <laughs> Our new cover slides back on. All tight by hand. Okay. So now we've got our front cover all mounted back on, the oil's all out. Next thing we're going to be doing is putting in our push type clutch fork, release bearing and carrier. So we've got all those parts sitting here. First thing I'm going to do before I forget is put the rubber on, the dust boot. 
which goes around that way. So you'll find that it can only go one way because of the cutout inside the actual boot itself. And it matches up. You can actually see that on camera, the little fork. the C. Yeah, so the fork can only go through one way. If I kind of push it through the other side, you see that it only fits through the C one way. If I try to go the other side, it won't work very well. I mean, if you did that game as a young kid with the square pegs and holes and stuff, you'd, you'd be able to figure it out pretty You'll easily. Understand. So our clutch fork, <coughs> when you buy a brand new clutch fork from Nissan, they do come with this spring for the push types at least. And that just pushes over your, uh, your pivot ball. And I've already greased up the inside of this clutch fork, so I'm not gonna worry about the ball because that's a contact point. So I'm just gonna slide our fork on. And I'm just going to leave that sitting about there for the moment. Next thing we're going to do is put our bearing on. This little clip here, all that does is hold your carrier to the actual clutch fork. That is the direction we're looking for. So that the ridges is what your fork will sit on. So you kind of imagine that pushing on there, this ridge will lift up and that'll push down on the fork. Same deal, contact points have been greased pretty well. There's still plenty of grease on there. Just gonna put a little bit of grease on the shaft and then we can slide the carrier on and mount the bearing. So a little bit of a trick for putting these carriers on is locate the carrier onto the fork before you slide it on. Otherwise you will have a lot of difficulties so before you've even pushed the fork into place, slide your bearing into place. That's shocking lighting, but... One side, all right, pretty much there. So now we can slide the bearing back and locate our fork. And you could hear that really click into place. That's what you're looking for. Give it a quick tug as well and just make sure that it's not gonna pop off. And then, as Connor will be showing there, if he's simulating what the slave cylinder is going to be doing, you can see that it slides nicely along the shaft. That's most of the conversion done. The last little thing we have to do is drill out the holes to put our slave on. So, like I was mentioning earlier, our two provisions are right there. So, we're going to be doing this in two parts. To start with, for our first hole, we're going to be marking right in the middle of that hole there and using an 8.5 millimeter drill bit. That's the important number, 8.5 millimetres, which is one of these little drill bits here. I just went and bought myself a brand new one. The left hand side hole is where we're going to mark right in the middle. We're going to dot punch it and then drill our hole there right through. And then we're going to tap that out. The one part that we're waiting for, well, which is on the car still when we go to put the gearbox on, is we'll be actually getting the slave and using the slave as our reference point so we know exactly where the second hole has to go. They don't have to be perfect because the bolts have a little bit of wiggle room, but it's good to get as close as possible and to have it as level as possible. I'm using a set of digital vernier calipers to find out exactly the middle of this circle here. So from top to bottom, it is roughly 21.25 millimetres. So we'll calculate half of that and make a mark roughly in the middle. And then I'd assume, same deal on the other side. Got about 20.3, so we'll make two marks difference. and then make a dot right in the middle. A Parkinson's. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So it'd be, let's say, roughly 10 mil on the top. That's what we've got there. And then 10 mil from the side. 9.5. That's about right. That's about right. The 
The next thing you want to do is grab an M10 by 1.5 tap and just tap into the hole that you've just drilled out. This is a long kind of process, so. So we're gonna put our slave on, mark the hole, drill through, get it all lined up. And then that's all there is to it. That's all it takes to convert it over. It's quite cheap to do. The whole process is about maybe 200, 250 bucks max in parts. So it's a cheap conversion to do. You save money on your clutch and a lot more parts support the push type clutch and they're a lot cheaper. So that's the main reason people do it. It's because it's nice and cheap. Your clutches don't cost a fortune. Clutches are one of those things that are gonna fail quite often for whatever it may be, too much power, too much torque, too much sending, whatever it may be, clutches fail. And it's just one of those things that happens. And you'd rather have to spend 400 bucks on another heavy duty rather than pay $1,000 on a heavy duty pull type clutch. So you spend that $250 and you save yourself extra money in the long run. That's what I believe. Obviously everyone has their own opinion on it, but for me, push type is the way to go.